um, we're not going to wait for the rest. So we're going to start right now. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, let's, let's continue because I need to finish off chapter two today. And then um, so that we can move on to chapter three. Uh, wait, I forgot something. Okay, so can you see my PowerPoint slide on uh, generation of uh, SSB SC signal? Yes, Miss, we can okay. see it. Good. So uh, I believe this is where we stopped uh, last lecture, where we talked about the three ways of uh, generating a single sideband suppressed carrier signal. So for today, we're going to move on to uh, the recovery of the uh, SSB SC signal. All right. So as the name suggests, uh, the SSBSC uh, use the suppressed carrier technique. So therefore, the only way to recover the SSBSC signal is by uh, synchronous detection. All right, so that is the same, uh, exactly the same method as the uh, double sideband suppressed carrier. All right, so the only difference is single sideband suppressed carrier will only transmit one sideband. Yeah? So for recovery process, it's the same. Yeah, so what is uh, synchronous detection? Synchronous detection, again, is to multiply the incoming uh, single sideband suppressed carrier signal with the local carrier, all right, with the local carrier, and then followed by uh, low-pass filtering. Because after multi multiplying the um, SSB SC signal with the local carrier, again, you are going to get uh, the baseband component and also uh, another component at um, two, 2 FC here. All right, so the center at 2 FC here. So that means uh, you can easily recover the, uh, in this example, I uh, actually use the upper side band that we transmitted. So you can actually recover the upper side band by, uh, by passing it through a low pass filter. All right, so that will block the high frequency component and then the low frequency, which is the baseband signal, will be allowed to pass through the filter and therefore give us back the um, original message that we transmitted. Okay, so that is for the modulation. Then the application of single sideband. Uh, single sideband, as you can see, the bandwidth is very narrow. All right, and uh, we only transmit one sideband. So therefore, it's not suitable for uh, any um, information that require a lot of details, all right? So it's more suitable for speech, yeah, the speech, because speech, uh, the bandwidth is only um, three to five kilohertz, yeah? Uh, music and video require a lot more bandwidth, so it's not suitable for single sideband application. All right, so some of the uh, typical example uh, telephone multiplex system. So telephone, again, when you call someone, you just talk only, right? And then um, for point-to-point -point communication, so again, uh, some, I think in the old days, uh, some, some of the point-to-point uh, -point communication like uh, over the, um, the walkie-talkie and things like that, so they actually use a single sideband uh, uh, technique. And this is, this is again, uh, useful where you need power saving. All right, you need power saving because you just want to save the power uh, from, uh, as compared to double sideband full carrier or double sideband suppressed carrier. Because double sideband sup uh, suppressed carrier, you need power for two sideband. All right, and then double sideband full carrier, you need power for the two sideband. You also need power for the carrier. So you need more power in, in the two cases there, all right. But for single sideband, uh, you only need to transmit power for the sideband that you are transmitting. Okay, so um, this slide show you 
some of the advantages of a single sideband suppressed carrier modulation over di double sideband full carrier uh, modulation. Right, if you recall how we actually come about from double sideband full carrier to single sideband uh, suppressed carrier, is that the um, one of them is the bandwidth. All right, so by transmitting only one sideband, uh, we actually save uh, half of the bandwidth. Right, so um, without without jeopardizing on the signal that we transmit. Right, we say we because both sidebands are actually transmitting the same signal anyway. Uh, and uh, we also achieve a lot of power saving, yeah, as compared to double sideband full carrier. Image, uh, remember the double sideband full carrier, um, the carrier just to transmit the carrier, we actually use up sixty seven percent of the uh, power, right? Minimum sixty percent of the power in uh, sending the carrier. So if we use single sideband suppressed carrier, we are not sending the carrier, yeah. So uh. So again, uh, the additional saving um, come from uh, sending just one sideband alone. So this gives us a total power saving of uh, 80, about 83%. And then the third advantage of uh, single sideband suppressed carrier over double sideband full carrier is that the uh, interference of noise is much reduced. All right. And of course, this is because we actually only send one sideband. So we actually use less bandwidth. So uh, because there is less bandwidth being used, therefore the amount of noise added to our signal will actually be lower as well. Uh, however, the uh, advantages does not come without any uh, disadvantages. So there are two listed here. The first one is, uh, we have seen this earlier, la, to, to generate and uh, to receive the single sideband signal is uh, not as straightforward as the double sideband full carrier, right? So we have to use a selective filtering, a phase shifting or weaver method, you know. And recovery wise is pretty similar to double sideband suppressed carrier, but compared to full carrier, again, it's more uh, complicated because you need your you need your local carrier to be in sync with the one at the transmitter. So that is uh, quite a hard requirement to meet, yeah. And then for um yeah, this is what is mentioned here. Uh, the single sideband transmitter and receiver need to have uh, excellent frequency stability. All right. So we have seen because because the uh, recovery process require a uh, coherent detection. Coherent is the same as uh, synchronous. So that means the the uh, transmitter and the receiver need to have a uh, very good uh, frequency stability in the sense that the carrier frequency need to be stable and in sync. Okay, uh, a slight change in frequency will hamper the quality of the transmitted signal. Yeah, we have seen this, isn't it? So if uh, if the uh, frequency of the carrier at the transmitter is uh, not in in the same phase uh, with the with the carrier at the receiver, therefore uh, there will be an effect of uh, uh, cosine theta, right? Or cosine theta, where theta actually is the uh, angle of uh, the phase shift. Um, so it's, it actually has the same problem with double sideband suppressed carrier. So again, uh, just to emphasize the point, yeah, SSB is only used for speech. Because speech, uh, as compared to music, uh, speech, when when uh, the quality of speech is not so good, at least you can still hear, can still work out what it means. But uh, when the quality of music is poor, uh, you don't want to listen to it at all, isn't it? Okay, so that brings us to the last uh, AM modulation scheme for this uh, chapter. Uh, that is a vestigial sideband, or in short, VSB. All right, so VSB uh, was developed to actually resolve some of the issues that we face in uh, single sideband, or SSB. Right, uh, and then recall again, uh, SSB. <laughs> SSB is rather difficult to generate because uh, normally, normally uh, SSB will require will require the message signal to have a uh, now around DC. That means uh, you cannot have very low frequency component in your uh, message that you want to transmit. If you have that, uh, you have significant amount of power in the low frequency component. 
it will be very hard to actually filter the um, sideband out. All right. But a uh, real life signal, real life signal actually has some uh, significant component at low frequency. All right. So therefore, SSP uh, is is not that practical. Okay. You can still you can still use SSP to transmit speech, but uh, but the the receiver will actually uh hear voice that is different from the original one because the a lot of the low frequency component has been uh attenuated. Okay, uh, so the pitch is slightly different now, but the message is still the same. Um, then the SSB, okay, SSB also require a sharp cutoff filter. Yeah, remember that? Uh, we need to have a sharp cutoff filter so that we can have a, a, a clear cut between the double side band, uh, between the uh, lower side band and upper side band. All right. And uh, if you were to use the phase shifted method to actually uh, uh, generate the single side band, suppressed carrier signal the phase shifter uh, uh ideal phase shifter is not real realizable all right so in practice uh, we only have a, a phase shifter that is uh, close to 90 degree but not exactly 90 degree all right so again that is going to impact the quality of the uh, ssb signal and uh, vestigial sideband Vestigial sideband or another name is asymmetric sideband. All right, asymmetric sideband basically is a compromise between uh, double sideband and single sideband. So it actually transmit uh, in a way that it actually transmit 25% more bandwidth than single sideband. So if you look at the diagram on the right hand side here, right, we have a message, a baseband signal that has a significant amount of uh, uh, component at low frequency here all right so if after converting uh, the signal to a double sideband signal all right we have a double sideband here right and then uh, let's say we use uh, selective filtering to actually uh, filter one sideband um, so if you use ssb you need to have a sharp cut off here all right because you just want, we just want to send the uh, in this case the upper sideband um, and we know that the uh, sharp cut off uh, filter is not realizable in practice. Yeah, so VSV or vestigial sideband basically allow you to use a filter that is not ideal, all right. So, but then you are allowed to transmit twenty five percent more bandwidth. So basically, you are going to do send your um, message signal, um, um, not not just the one of the sideband along, but also a bit of the uh, information from the in this case the lower sideband all right so this is the vestigial sideband okay so you can see that it does not actually uh, completely rejecting one sideband yeah it allow this gradual cut off there and uh, some of the component from the lower sideband is allowed to transmit together with the upper sideband all right so what about the recovery all right, the, as far as the recovery at the receiver is concerned, all right, uh, same thing, um, we recover it uh, the same way as we recover the uh, single sideband signal. So we use a synchronous detector. All right, and uh, the trick here is to, you need to have a filter. You need to have a filter that actually, uh, well, it's a low pass filter that actually uh, attenuate attenuate the uh, additional components from the lower sideband that you do not want and then boost uh, some of the uh, frequency component here all right so this is called equalizer filter all right so equalizer filter basically will boost the frequency that you want and then suppress or attenuate the frequency components of the signal that you do not want all right so basically your filter design here at the receiver is actually uh, um, more more complicated lah, as compared to just a straight, uh, 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 a simple low pass filter. And this technique is uh, used to be used to be used in uh, low cost uh, TV broadcast. All right. But I think nowadays, uh, with uh, all a lot of TV transmission now being uh, digitized, so this technique is no longer in use. Lah. So that's just a bit of a um, development in amplitude modulation for your uh, information. 
Okay, um, so let's come to the topic uh, frequency division multiplexing. All right, frequency division multiplexing, as I mentioned in chapter one before, all right, uh, frequency div uh, division multiplexing allow, allow, allow us to transmit uh, many signals on the same channel. All right. So the trick is uh, we need to we need to modulate uh, uh, each signal um, using different carrier frequency. All right, in this example here on the right hand side, um, we have signal number one here. All right, this signal we are going to modulate it with uh, let's say this is a single sideband signal. All right, and I'm transmitting the upper sideband. All right. So here, uh, I use a carrier frequency uh, 104 for signal number one, carrier frequency 100 for signal number two, all right, carrier frequency 96 for signal number three, and so on. All right, and each signal has a bandwidth of uh, four kilohertz. So this is speech, uh, definitely speech, because four kilohertz only. Yeah, and uh, what, what we can do is uh, we can actually combine all these uh, 12 uh, voice signals, all right, we add them up together and uh, and then we can actually modulate it again, uh, use it to modulate another carrier, all right, another carrier, um, this frequency, using this carrier frequency, and then we send as an entire group of baseband signal, yeah. Um, then of course, of course, uh, in between the signal right signal band you can actually uh, is actually better to provide a guide band uh, all right a gap so that uh, to ease filtering later on um okay so uh, that means uh, with the well the the original voice signal the baseband signal is 4 kilohertz right after we combine all the 12 uh, voice signals together we have a new baseband signal of uh, 48 kilohertz, which is the uh, voice signal coming from 12 different channels, right? Um, so this, we can group them, and then uh, we use it to modulate another carrier, which is a much higher uh, carrier. Um, frequency, if it's 48 kilohertz, 552 minus 48 will give you 504, right? Yeah. So now we use it, uh, multiply with the carrier frequency of 504 kilohertz. So uh, then we can transmit this whole group uh, of uh, 12 voice signals together. Right. Similarly, we can also combine uh, other voice group right, channels from uh, uh, use that uh, modulate different carrier frequency as group two, group three, and so on. Right. So we can also combine all these, let's say this example, we have five groups, all right, five groups of uh, 12 boy channels. So that will be what, five times 12 is 60. 60 uh, boy signals can be transmitted together because we can combine them. And then uh, again, we treat this whole thing as a basement. We transmit them uh, using, again, uh, we modulate, we use it to modulate another carrier. All right, um, let's say this is uh, 3204. So modulate another carrier and transmit at a much higher frequency. All right, um, 3204 minus 240 will be about uh, 29 something. All right, so, we, so you can see using frequency division multiplexing, we can, we can actually group uh, many, many signals together. All right. From individual baseband to uh, group of subbands, all right, to even super group of uh, subbands, we can even combine them, uh, uh, combine many many groups of uh, subbands together. Okay, so that's how we can actually transmit so many signals uh, over the same uh, over the same uh, airspace, all right, the free space. So radio link allow you to actually transmit. Uh, a lot more information, all right, as compared to wired channel, right? Okay, because wired channel, for wired channel to actually combine and transmit many signals over wired channels, you, you need to use time division multiplexing, 
I, I'm going to talk more about time division multiplexing later on in another chapter. So time division multiplexing requires you to switch between different voice signals. All right. So the switching circuit actually has a limitation on how fast it can switch. So therefore, uh, as far as uh, frequency comparing frequency division multiplexing to time division multiplexing, frequency division multiplexing allow you to transmit a lot more. All right, a lot more signals. Okay, that's why uh, nowadays a lot of things are going wireless. Yeah, because uh, we can transmit a lot more signal uh, wirelessly over uh, as compared to uh, over wire. Right. And what about recovery process? Uh, to recover the signal, let's say we, we uh, actually transmit, uh, we want to recover signal number one. All right. How do we recover signal number one from this super group that we actually transmitted? So what you do now is the uh, uh, um, back process. Uh, yeah? So here, um, we already, just now we use a carrier to actually carry my uh, entire super group here. So at the receiver, at the receiver, same thing, I multiply. All right, I multiply with this carrier frequency here. All right, I multiply with this carrier frequency here so that I can recover this whole uh, group of five. Yeah, and then I multiply. Uh, what do I do next is uh, I perform uh, bandpass filtering. All right, after I perform bandpass filtering, I multiply again with this carrier frequency, the one I use here. So that I can recover group one. All right. So after I recover group one, uh, again uh, I pass it through band pass filter. All right. To get this group one, then I multiply again with the carrier of uh, one o four, because I want to recover group one message number one, isn't it? So I multiply again. All right. So again, uh, in 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 the receiver. All right. Using synchronous, detec synchronous detection, uh, you just need to multiply the um, incoming signal with the carrier frequency in order to recover the um, baseband signal. Yeah. So just now when we transmit, we actually uh, multiply one time, two times, three times, right? So at the receiver, we again multiply three times, uh, but in the reverse order. Yeah. And then uh, how to recover this one? Use low pass filtering. All right. So it's the same uh, same concept, one concept for uh, individual uh, signal modulation. Okay, any questions on frequency division multiplexing before I move on? Uh, can repeat the the rec receiver part. Oh, receiver part. Okay, receiver part again. Uh, you see, ah, uh, to. Maybe the transmitter side. Okay, when when we transmit, right? When we transmit, we actually modulate. We carry out this use use the baseband signal. We modulate to this frequency. Let's say FC one. All right, and then uh, we combine this cell channel, and then we modulate with uh frequency. Let's say uh. I call it FC two lah. Just to is just to differentiate between these two a different frequency. Then uh, to further further uh, multiplex the signal, I modulate to frequency number three. All right. So I transmit. This is what I did when I transmit uh, to another transmit. All right. So I multiply three times. So at the receiver to recover signal number one here, I need to uh, do the reverse process. All right, so meaning uh, out of this whole group of signal that I have, all right, out of this whole group of signal that I have, all right, I want, I only want, because my signal number number one is in super group one, all right, so I need to recover super group one first. To recover super group one, all right, I need to, I need to go backwards. So I need to multiply again with uh, FC3, all right, FC3. After that, I do a band pass filtering to recover this group here, all right? To recover this group here, and then I multiply with FC2 to bring, to give me this uh, sub band that I have, all right? The sub band that I have. And then from here, uh, mul after multiply, again, followed by band pass filtering, all right? Because my, my signal uh, message number one, 
is between after I multiply is between 60 to 108 kilohertz. So therefore I need to do another uh, round of filtering. All right. So after I uh, pass this signal or the result of multiplication to a bandpass filter, um, I multiply again with this uh, this carrier frequency 104. All right, so that I can recover my baseband signal number one. After multiply, of course, filtering again. Nah. So it's always multiply, filtering, multiply, filtering, multiply, filtering. All right, that is the uh, coherent detection or synchronous detection method. Ken. Okay, answer my question. Okay, good. All right, so this slide show you a summary of the amplitude modulation scheme. All right, advantages. Uh, well, the first one is, uh, as we've seen before, uh, the amplitude modulation scheme is very simple to implement. All right, all you need is just a, a multiplier. All right, uh, if you are using double sideband suppressed carrier, and if you are using double sideband full carrier, then you need a, a, a circuit to actually do the Add the carrier to the double side band surprise carrier signal. Yeah. Um, so implementation wise is very simple. Um, then demodulation or recovery also is pretty simple. All right. Technically speaking, uh, you only if you want to do synchronous detection, again you just multiply uh, the incoming signal with the uh, local carrier followed by low pass filtering. Um, so AM receiver was very Cheap to build, all right. You don't really need any specialized comp uh, specialized components. So a lot of hobbies actually in the past they built their own AM receiver before. Um, these advantages of uh, amplitude modulation technique. Uh, we have seen that uh, as far as uh, power is concerned, it's not efficient, especially in a double sideband full carrier. All right, we actually um, spend uh, at least sixty seven percent of the power. Uh, to transmit the carrier along, all right. Um, second thing is uh, the bandwidth usage also is not efficient, all right, because we actually send, uh, well, we actually use twice the necessary uh, um, side or bandwidth to actually transmit our signal, and this is in the case of a double side band suppressed carrier and double side band full carrier, all right. Uh, then amplitude modulation signal is actually very prone to noise. Okay, it's very sensitive to noise, right? Um, because noise are mostly amplitude based and our signal is amplitude, all right? Our signal is amplitude also. So noise uh, can add or add uh, our noise level uh, to our end signal level or reduce our signal level, all right? And then uh, our AM signal, our AM detector are very, very sensitive to noise as well. Okay, so this is uh, this is actually the, the killing point of uh, amplitude modulation, where it's actually is very sensitive to uh, noise. Okay, so uh, let's do a bit of uh, analysis uh, on the um, performance of the various type of uh, AM modulation schemes in the presence of noise. Okay, um, so we need, we're going to answer these three questions here. Um, how do various analog modulation scheme, in our case here is uh, amplitude modulation scheme, all right, perform uh, in the presence of noise? And we want to find out which scheme actually perform the best. All right, and uh, to be fair, we need to find a way where we can measure the performance uh, uh, correctly. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this diagram show you the uh, model of a uh, analog communication scheme. All right, where we have our input signal, I it's called MT here. All right, um, so this signal goes through a transmitter. All right, this transmitter basically convert the signal to a form that is suitable for transmission. So in our case here, this is uh, our our modulators, our modulation circuit, uh, right? And then, um, then this signal is uh, then will travel through the channel. All right, in the channel, noise will be added to the signal that we have. All right. 
So as I mentioned before, uh, in this course, uh, we are consider uh, the most uh, common type of noise in transmission system, which is um, additive white Gaussian noise. All right, additive white Gaussian noise. So additive means the noise will be added to our signal, all right? And at the receiver, at the receiver, basically we have to perform a uh, demodulation to actually recover our signal. Okay, so I'm going to use uh, a few symbol here to represent the power. So now PT is the uh, power of the signal that I transmit. Yeah, PS is the power of the signal that I receive at the receiver. And PN is the power of the noise, all right, that come together with the uh, signal that I receive. Yeah. And um, we are going to use uh, additive white Gaussian noise. So additive white Gaussian noise have a noise spectral density of this form. All right, so white, white means uh, it has uh, even amplitude uh, throughout the entire uh, frequency range. All right. So again, this because we are using double-sided noise. So uh, the, the double-sided noise uh, power is uh, n0 over 2. All right. So if you are taking uh, uh, one side only, then you have to multiply this by 2. Uh, yeah? um, then the bandwidth, uh, Bt is the bandwidth, bandwidth of our signal. All right. Bt is the bandwidth of our signal, where Fc is the... Um, the carrier frequency that we use uh, in our modulation. Okay. Then how to measure the system quality? So for analog system, we com we normally use a signals to noise ratio. All right. So signals to noise ratio, um, by definition, uh, we are going to look at the signal to uh, noise ratio at the receiver. All right. Basically, how good a communication is. Uh, depend a lot on how easy we can recover the message signal at the receiver. So therefore, we need to look at the uh, signal to noise ratio at the receiver, right? So again, uh, what we are looking at is the uh, average power of the message signal at the receiver output, which is PS, all right, over the uh, average power of noise at the receiver output, which is PN, all right? And normally, signals to noise ratio is expressed in a uh, unit of uh, decibel dB. All right, this is just to recall, just to recall, uh, signals to noise ratio in dB is equals to 10 log 10 uh, signals to noise ratio uh, in the um, power domain, uh, in the normal domain. Okay, this SNR uh, dep um, again depends on your. Um, here I use 10 times log 10, uh, provided this is in power. All right. So if this is in amplitude, all right, signals to noise ratio is in amplitude, like voltage or current, then you have to do 20 log. So again, it depends on uh, you are talking about the power or you're talking about the amplitude. All right. So normally we use power. All right. Use power, then straight away is uh, 10 log. Okay, um, why we use decibel? Okay, we use decibel because uh, there's a wide range of power level. So it can be 100 times, 200 times, you know, or, or even uh, more, than, uh, more than that. So, um, so for example, um, ratio of 2 uh, will give you 3 dB. All right, ratio of 4 will give you 6 dB and ratio of 10 will give you 10 dB. But you go up, uh, then of course the number will get, the, the difference in the number will be smaller and smaller. So now, uh, okay, PT, the transmitted power. Okay, what can we say about the transmitted power? Transmitted power basically has some limitation, all right? Of course, you can say I transmit higher power, then uh, of course the receiver will uh, receive a higher power. All right. Uh, however, there are limitations. All right. So the limitations are uh, equipment capability. All right. How much power can your equipment generate? Second thing is battery life. All right. If you are using a, 
uh, mobile device, all right, how long can your battery last? Yeah, if you use more power, of course, your battery life will last uh, shorter. All right, that's no good, isn't it? Um, also, the cost, okay, because the cost of uh, generating high power is definitely more. Yeah, and also in some area, and actually in many countries, uh, um, there are government restrictions on how much power you can generate. Yeah, uh, I mean, you can send your signal with, yeah. And also, you need to worry about if you if you transmit with too high a power, and your your neighbor channel also transmit with very high power, it's very likely they will interfere with each other. Okay, and uh, nowadays with a lot of uh, emphasis on green power and so on, uh, you have to in some country they have to make sure they actually uh, uh, adhere to the uh, green power usage uh, in their equipment. So therefore, uh, you can't really say, uh, I just transfer with high power, then I'm okay. No, you can't. Okay? There are limitations. So uh, to have a fair comparison, then we are going to use the uh, same transmission power for all the schemes. <laughs> all right. And then we are going to compare, we are going to compare uh, the modulation scheme with the baseband uh, signal. All right. So the modulation SNR, uh, whatever modulation scheme we use, we are trans we're going to compare with the uh, the signal to the noise ratio of um, baseband. Okay, so for baseband, okay, what is baseband? Baseband signal does not use modulation, isn't it? So we straight away transmit the signal as it is. So in this case, we transmit our signal called MT, and this signal has a bandwidth W. All right. So we just transmit it as it is, and of course, uh, noise will be added along the way. Yeah, and uh, at the receiver here, because there is no, uh, there is no correct modulation, so we can straight away at the receiver we can straight away use a low pass filter with a bandwidth W to recover the signal that we want. All right, so that will give us the um, message at the receiver side. So baseband communication, uh, as I mentioned before, is only suitable for trans transmission over the wire. Uh. All right. So in this case, if we assume no loss, no attenuation along the way, yeah. So the power that we transmit, all right, the power that we transmit, and of course, of course, no modulation, meaning the power that we transmit is actually the same as the uh, power of the message. All right, we send the message as it is. Right, so this is PT equals to P, where P is the power of the message. Right, and then uh, we assume ideal transmission, ideal line, uh, which does not attenuate our signal. So therefore, uh, the power that we receive, power of the signal that we receive, uh, is the same as the power uh, of the signal that we transmitted, and also same as the uh, power of the message. All right, this is for baseband, yeah. Okay, so uh, this diagram here actually show you uh, the power spectrum density of the signal MT. All right, so it has a bandwidth W. Can okay, because now we are plot uh, sketching over the uh, positive and negative frequency, so you have a signal that span from minus W to W. And uh, noise, the noise spectral density, again, uh, if we take positive and negative uh, frequency into consideration, the noise uh, spectral density uh, will have an amplitude of and not over 2. All right, so this is the signal as it is uh, in the channel or in the wire. So after applying a low pass filter with the bandwidth W, all right, this is the one, again, ideally speaking, this is the one that we have. Okay, this is the one that we have uh, at the output of the low pass filter. Yeah, so you only allow a uh, signal between um, minus W to W to pass and also noise between minus W and W to pass. All right, so how do we calculate the power of no signal and the power of noise? To calculate the power signal and the power of noise, we just need to compute the area under the curve. All right, this one is for the signal. And for noise, is this rectangular box here. All right. 
Okay. So let's uh um uh, white Gaussian noise between. So that gives us all right the uh power of the signal is p and then the power of noise which is area under the the rectangular box. All right, that will give us uh, Wn. All right, 2W times W0 over 2, that will give us Wn0. Okay, so signal to noise ratio uh, at the receiver output for our baseband signal basically will be the power of the signal. All right, power of the signal at the receiver, which is Ps. All right, we talked about it uh, before. So because there is no attenuation, assume, assuming no attenuation over the wire, so PS basically is same as PT, all right, which is same as P. So now I put it as PT over the noise power is N not W, which is what we get from here, all right? So this is uh, again for ideal uh, baseband signals to noise ratio with uh, no propagation loss, all right? So if you look at the uh, expression for signals to noise ratio here, uh, there are a few things we can do in order to improve the signal to noise ratio, isn't it? So the first one we talked about before, which is uh, increasing the transmitted power. All right? Again, uh, we have limitation on how much we can do here. Yeah. And uh, second thing we can do is by reducing W. Right? Reducing W, which is our message bandwidth. Um, but again, uh, if you actually reduce the message bandwidth, that means uh, we're going to reduce the amount of information that we can transmit. Okay, also not a good, uh, not a good, uh, what I call that uh, thing to do. Uh. And the third, the third uh, items that we can play with is to make the channel or the receiver less noisy meaning we need to reduce and not, okay? Um, a lot of times there is not much you can do over the channel. Unless you use wired, then you can say, oh, I, I, change, I change and I use a better wire, yes. Then you can improve your and not if you are using wired. But if you are using uh, free space or radio link, um, there's not much you can do over the channel, all right? So, um, so these, are, these are the uh, three, uh, these are the three items or the three uh, criteria that actually will uh, determine how good our signals to noise ratio is. Okay, transmitted power, the noise power, as well as the bandwidth. And this is for baseband, yeah? So let's uh, look at the uh, double side band. Double side band suppress carrier modulation scheme with additive noise, all right? So for double side bands, uh, suppressed carrier signal, I'm going to represent it with this uh, ST. All right, and uh, ST is given by this expression. All right, this expression I know is slightly different from the one I used uh, previously. So uh, A is the amplitude, okay, amplitude, basically amplitude of the uh, carrier signal. MT is our message signal. All right, and our carrier is a cosine wave of uh, frequency fc yeah and then for signal recovery because we are using double sideband suppressed carrier modulation scheme so the we can we can only use synchronous detection all right we can only use synchronous detection here at the receiver so the let's look at this the diagram at the bottom first so we have a double sideband suppressed carrier signal that we transmit so along the channel, a uh, noise will be added to it, all right? And uh, what we have here is at the receiver, we actually pass the signal. Okay, this one, this one in this circuit, we're actually passing the signal through a band pass filter first, all right? Band pass filter first, so that will that limit the um, the signal that we want to recover to the range that we are interested in. Okay, then uh, after that, I multiply the signal with a local carrier yeah and then uh, followed by a low pass filtering okay so uh my the signal that i receive yeah um at the receiver basically is um the signal that the transmitter sent st 
um, added with noise. Okay, noise are represented with uh, NT. And noise, we, as far as noise is concerned, because it's uh, additive white Gaussian noise, so uh, we, as far as uh, we are concerned, uh, we need to consider the in-phase noise and the out-phase noise, all right? In-phase noise, uh, that means noise that are in-phase with our um, signal. And out-of-phase noise, uh, this signal that is uh, uh, out-of-phase, so normally it's sine, uh, okay? Because sine and cos are 90 degree out-of-phase. So, um, okay, ST, what I do next is uh, I put in the expression for ST, which is this one here. All right. So, collecting the terms uh, for common factor, which is uh, cos 2 pi FCT, then I have this. All right. So, basically, it's the baseband signal, the my message signal, multiply with the amplitude of the uh, carrier I use at the transmitter, and plus the uh, noise component that are in phase with the uh, signal. Okay, so multiply. Uh, after I multiply with uh, the local carrier of amplitude 2, all right, uh, you go through the um, steps. Here I'm going to have cos square. Here also I'm cos square. So uh, applying the trigonometry identity. Then I get two, two cos square basically is one plus cos of uh, four. This is two pi FCT, I get four pi FCT. All right, because two square, uh, two cos square x is equal to one plus, one plus cos two x, right, cos two x. So this is x, this is two x. So this is how uh, this four come about. Okay, same thing here for the noise that are in phase. I also have this term. All right, but else for sine, for sine uh, again, um, we're gonna have this. All right, because uh, well, you can go through the trigo yourself. Uh. But what we're interested in basically after low pass filter, what happened? All right, so after low pass filter, we actually remove uh, all the high frequency component, isn't it? Which is uh, cosine four pi fc gone, sine four pi fc also gone. So we are left with the baseband signal, which is amt plus. And CT, which is our noise. All right. So, what are the signal power at the receiver? So, signal power at the receiver basically is this. Okay, the uh, A square. Uh, and then this M square. M square basically is uh, similar to our VM square before. All right. The amplitude of our um, message signal. Okay. Divide by two. All right. Uh, so, M square over two basically is the power of a message signal. All right message uh, power of our message signal m square over 2. So I can safely say that uh, my receive uh, power, my receive signal power is actually a square p. All right, what is p? p is my message signal power. All right, and power of the noise, all right, the next thing we need to compute is the power of the noise. To, to compute the power of the noise, basically we need to um, perform integration. Again, we need to calculate the area under the curve. All right, in this case, uh, it's from minus W to W, all right, and then N0, all right, why N0? Because uh, N0, um, because the double sideband surprise signal has a bandwidth to omega, the band pass filter also restrict our bandwidth to two omega. All right, so the, the modulation, the modulation process basically have increased our signal bandwidth from W not omega, sorry, W to 2W. All right, from W to 2W. Therefore, uh, we have to, our signal power now is become N0. All right, or you can you can say N0 over 2 and then multiply by 2. Uh. So that will give us a noise power of uh, 2 and not uh, W. Okay, where W is the bandwidth of the signal. Uh, bandwidth of the signal. So now, uh, collecting the terms uh, to get the expression for our signal to noise ratio. So P is uh, A square P over 2. All right, power of the signal at the receiver is A square P over 2. And uh, power of the noise is uh, N not W. All right, N not W. So again, I need to express in transmitted power just to be fair for comparison. So transmitted power is basically 
a square or a square over two. This is the power of the carrier, and this is the power of the uh, message, right? A square m square over four, all right? And uh, oh, you want to know where this come up, come from? Uh, refer to the double sideband uh, suppressed carrier um, slides, uh, right? Then from there you can compute the power. So transmitter power basically is again m square over two is the message power, which is p. So I can express the uh, I can substitute a square p over two with p t. Uh. So this a square over two a square p over 2, I can replace it with pt. All right. So that gives me the signal to noise ratio of double sideband suppressed carrier being a pt over n not w. All right. pt over n not w. So let's compare. All right. Our baseband signal to noise ratio is pt over n not w. And our double sideband suppressed carrier signal, SNR, is, also, is the same. All right, it's also PT over and not W. So they are actually the same. All right. So the, the conclusion we have is uh, the double sideband suppressed carrier system has the same SNR performance as the baseband signal. Of course, this comes with a condition, all right? Provided that our synchronous detection perform uh, as what it should be, uh, perform to our theoretical uh, analysis. All right, so that's for double sideband suppressed carrier signal. So if you do the same for the rest, then you're going to get this table, All right? So this table is uh, the double sideband coherent detection, the one we just did just now. All right, and then uh, we're going to compare them in terms of the, let's look at the last one. The last one is the figure of merit, All right? Figure of merit meaning uh, is equals to the output SNR over the reference SNR. So what it means is, Output SNR is the, the SNR of a double sideband suppressed carrier co uh, coherent modulation over the reference SNR. What is reference SNR? Reference SNR is our baseband. All right, the baseband SNR. So um, as far as the figure of merit for double sideband suppressed carrier with coherent detection is one because they are the same, right? Double sideband coherent detection. Uh, the SNR is the same as the uh, SNR for double sideband baseband signal. So therefore, we have a figure of merit of one. So similarly, uh, single sideband coherent detection will also give you a uh, figure merit of one. All right. Uh, however, however, uh, the AM coherent detection, AM is full AM. So full AM stands for what is full AM? What's another name for full AM? Double sideband, full carrier. All right. So for double sideband, full carrier, you can expect you can expect the figure of merit to be less than one. All right. Why? Because a lot of transmitted power uh, are actually wasted in the carrier. All right. So uh, as far as the signal power at the receiver is concerned, is you can expect a lot less. Yeah. So therefore the Figure of merit is less than one, all right? And uh, same thing, if we use uh, coherent uh, envelope detection to recover our full AM signal or double sideband full carrier signal, all right, the performance, the figure of merit is also less than one. Again, this is for small noise, okay? Envelope detection uh, with small noise in the channel. But if the, uh, if the uh, channel has large noise, then you can expect the performance to be very, very poor. All right. So from this table, uh, we can actually see that uh, theoretically speaking, all right, theoretically speaking, the double sideband suppressed carrier and the double sideband uh, and the single sideband um, suppressed carrier, um, if you use coherent detection at the receiver, both of them are going to give you uh, the best um, signal to noise ratio performance, all right? Um, but the only problem is, the only problem is you must make sure, you must make sure that the receiver um, use the local carrier that is actually in sync with the uh, carrier at the transmitter, right? That is the condition, and which is actually quite hard to fulfill. Uh. 
Um, but for double sideband full carrier, all right, um, the performance is always not as good. All right, theoretically, it's already not as good as the um, coherent detection method uh, for suppressed carrier. Okay. Um, all right, so that ends, I think, I believe that ends our lecture on amplitude modulation. Any questions before I stop here? No question. Yeah, I know it's a bit, uh, it's quite a lot to digest. So do, do take time uh, after lecture. But uh, what I'm going to do next is, uh, I think it's a good time to take a break. All right, and after the break, we'll come back um, and then we will do, um, I think I will discuss uh, one of the tutorial questions. Okay, which uh, illustrate the points that I have just uh, taught you just now. Miss okay. Yumin, yes. you the question that you that you post in the Google Classroom, right? Uh, no, it's not. It's not. I'm going to discuss tutorial two question. Let me see. Uh, question nine. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Looks like I misunderstood something. Ah, uh, no, no. Oh, the, the question, the assignment question that I post in Google Classroom. Uh. That one, that one, yes. is to, that one is to be used for tutorial two, question four, I think. I'm, do, I'm going to do question nine later. Okay, let's take a short break. Let's say um, five minutes break, is that okay? Or what time is it now? Let me see, 12.02, uh, uh, round it up. Lah. Let's come back at 12.10. Is that all right? Okay. Okay, let's see you later. Huh?
Right, are we all back here? Yes, just now come back. Oh, yes. Okay. Good. Um, let's move on to question nine. Okay, to question nine. So let me show you question nine. Okay, can you see my OneNote screen? Yes. Okay, good. So question nine is about uh, two signals, two signals of a uh, different spectrum. Uh, well, bandwidth is the same. Um, the shape of the spectrums are different. Um, they are modulated together uh, as shown in this figure. So you can see uh, this is the frequency spectrum for message number one. All right, that's why it's written as M1 Omega. So bandwidth, uh, when bandwidth is 5,000 or radian per second. And uh, message number two here is M2 Omega. All right, bandwidth is again uh, same, 5,000 uh, radian per second. All right, so this is the uh, spectrum of these two signal. In time domain, they are called M1T and M2T respectively. Lah. All right, so... Just this is a term, common term being used. Yeah. And whenever you want to represent a signal in time domain, then in the bracket, you put T. Oh. If you want to represent a signal in frequency domain, so you either write omega or F. Oh. So in this case, it's omega. All right. And then in frequency domain, normally we use a uppercase. Time domain, we normally use a lowercase. Okay. So this signal uh, M1T, Right, in time domain is added to uh here is added to this m2t that has been multiplied with the cosine signal all right so basically from what we have learned whenever we multiply a message with a cosine signal basically we are now performing double sideband suppressed carrier modulation right so the what what we added here in time domain is the m1t with the uh, double-sided suppressed carrier signal of uh, M2. All right, so this is what we have in A. And then we add them up. After we add them up, then uh, we produce a signal B. All right, signal B, uh, we multiply with a cosine signal again. So we can see this uh, carrier frequency number two is uh, 20,000. Uh, carrier frequency number one is 10,000. All right, so it's quite common. Uh, your second second carrier frequency definitely has to be higher than the first carrier frequency. All right, and to produce a signal called C. All right, so what you need to do in this question is to determine the spectrum at point A, B, and C. All right, at point A, B, and C. Okay, so now uh, let's... Uh, Okay, at point A, point A. All right, point A basically is our message signal, all right, that has been uh, multiplied with the um, carrier signal. All right, so if you recall, if you recall from our lecture notes, we have a message like this, all right, and then we multiply with a carrier. This carrier is uh, 10,000. I hope you have, the, you have uh, <coughs> taken the time to actually <coughs> draw the frequency spectrum for uh, question one and question two yourself. Yeah? If you have done that, then this question will be easy. If you haven't done that, uh, then you'll be totally lost. So let me warn you first. Uh. So you better go through it. yeah. And uh, so now <clears throat> we multiply this M2T with this signal yeah, in time domain. So basically what it means in frequency domain, uh, I call this C1T. Yeah. So this is C1 omega. So that means in frequency domain, we are actually convolving them. All right. So convolving these two signal will give you does that give you? We actually shift the spectrum, isn't it? 
All right. We shift the spectrum to center from center at zero to center at 10k and also center at minus 10k. All right. So you're going to get this. All right, you're going to get this. So this is what I have here. So let me draw. This is what happened at point A. Okay, not to scale, but never mind. Okay, so this is 10,000. This is, oops, minus 10,000. Okay, so this is at point A. Uh, so again, this is in omega. All right, not to scale. Uh. So you know like they're actually well spaced out. Okay, this is at point A. Then at point B, what happened? At point B, I actually add uh, the signal at point A to uh, this M1T. All right, M1T have this spectrum. All right, so again, at point B, I just add the spectrum will do. All right, so I have this. Um, okay, so I have this. This is my origin. This is from M2. All right, I have uh, M1. Let me use a different color. Fifty wise almost similar. Uh, sorry that my drawing no good, uh, but then uh you know what I mean. Uh, all right. So this is uh, the red color one is M1. All right, and then the blue color one is M2. All right, again, this is omega. This is what happened at point B. All right, we add these two signal in time domain, basically in frequency domain, we just overlap the spectrum. All right, so we have now uh, at point B. So at point C, all right, at point C, we actually multiply the signal at point B with another uh, cosine signal. Let's say I call this uh, C2T. All right. So what happened is now I multiply in time domain. That is equivalent to I convolve in frequency domain, isn't it? All right. Um, okay. So I convolve in frequency domain. Now this one is 20. Oh, 20. Not enough space. Eh? I draw too big. Okay, 20, let's say, okay, I draw 20 here. This is 10, 20, this is 20. This is C2. Huh? Convo, uh, this is C2 omega. All right, it's at 20, 20. This is minus 20. Okay, this is my C2. So I'm convolving with this uh, spectrum of the cosine wave. All right, convolve with the spectrum of the cosine wave at um, all right, I'm convolving these two now. So when I convolve these two, uh, what does that mean? It actually means I shift the I shift the, this entire spectrum here, this entire spectrum here, instead of center at zero, this is zero, this is uh, 10K, right? This is minus 10K, all right? Let me jot down, this is 5K, this is minus 5K, so this is 15K and this is minus 15K, why not? Okay. I think I fill up this as well. You you can copy later on. Uh. 
so this is minus 15k minus 5k 5k 15k okay so this is uh So now uh, when I convolve, so that means uh, this whole thing, this whole spectrum here, instead of centering at zero, now it's going to center at 20K. All right, same concept, same concept, same concept as before. Because I, in previously, um, my message number two, all right, if you understood the concept of uh, convolution, then uh, you understand how the spectrum actually shifts now. So let's let me repeat again. So in previous message number two, all right, our spectrum center at zero. All right. So I multiply with the carrier of uh, frequency 10k. So carrier of uh, frequency 10k basically uh, has spectrum at plus minus 10k. So what happened is I shift this spectrum, entire spectrum, instead of centering at zero, now center at 10k. All right, so give me this. So same thing, this thing shift to center at minus 10k, all right? So this is uh, when we have a simple spectrum. Now we have a more complex spectrum that consists of two messages, all right? When we convolve, uh, it's actually the same thing. So the whole spectrum here, now we take the whole spectrum from minus 15k to 10k, instead of centering at zero, it's going to center at 20k after we convolve with a carrier of 20k. All right, so that's going to give us all right. So this is my 20k, zero, my minus 20k. All right, so I'm going to uh, center at here. So, um, right, let's draw this again in uh, color, good color. So I have my, this one here, All right? Same thing, this will center at minus 20K. All right, so this is 20K, so this will be 25K, right? So this will be minus 15K, and this will be a minus block. This will be just 15K. Okay, um, this is minus 25k, this is minus 15k over here. All right, so that is for, that is for uh, message one spectrum. And this blue color one, again, it be shifted accordingly. Uh. So you come here, uh, what is this, uh, 10k, all right. And uh, this side also. All right, so same thing on this side. Um, it's going to be. Okay, so what frequency we have, this is 25, so this is 30k, this is 35k. All right, so this will 5k, uh, oh no, not 5k, 15k. All right, this will be 15k, and this will be what? 10k, this will be 5k, All right? So again, this will be minus 5k, this is minus 10k, um, this will be 20. 25, so this will be minus 30, and this will be minus 35k. Okay, so this is at point C. All right, at point C. So where is point C? Point C is here after I multiply. Okay. <clears throat> um, And this is 
uh, what should I call? No name. Okay, no name. Okay, so that will be the spectrum and point C. Again, this is omega. All right, you want to get this down first? Uh, miss, mm. should we uh, write the amplitude? Um, there is, I think in this case, there is no need, right? Because the amplitude is not given, you're mistaken. Yeah, the amplitude here is not given. So there is no need to write the amplitude. Okay. Yeah, if the amplitude is given, yes, then you write the amplitude. Okay, uh, I think it's a bit too big for you. Let me... Yeah, I think here yeah, better. Okay. If you are viewing this over the phone, I'm sorry, like it's too small. Let me know when you have done. Then I'll move on to talk about B. If you're not done, then you better shout or else I move on already. If your friend say done, then I straight away move on. I see some message. Meaning what? Oh, screenshot. Ah, clever lah. Screenshot. But make sure you go and draw it yourself, huh? Because screenshot go to the memory of your phone. Memo go to your your memory, your own memory. Okay, next one. Suggest a method to recover each individual signal and the filter's passband. All right. So now, in order to uh, recover, how do we recover? All right. So to recover to recover the message signal, basically we reverse the process. Uh. All right, we reverse the process that has taken place uh, in the transmitting circuit. Let me draw a bigger one. I need a bit small. So now, um, the last step that we did in the transmitter is uh, multiply with the cosine two t. So at the receiver, all right, in order to recover we actually do the same thing. So here, we need to multiply again with cosine 20,000 T. All right, because after we multiply, that will shift the spectrum down to the spectrum of uh, B, what we have at B. Yeah, and then uh, after we multiply here, what we get is, uh, we get a, the sum of uh, M1T and uh, and the result of uh, the double sideband spectrum of M2T. Okay, so let's draw it first. So that is called C. I'm going to call this point D. Yeah? At point D, what happened? So I'm going to multiply. Okay, I'm going to multiply. That means uh, in, uh, in frequency domain, I'm convolving. Okay, I'm going to multiply with another carrier, 20K. I'm going to do synchronous detection, all right? So in this case, we can only do synchronous detection because it's a double sideband suppressed carrier modulation, all right? How do I know? How do I know? Because there is no addition of uh, any DC level. All right, no addition of DC level. So therefore, you can only recover using, um, using what do you call it? Uh, uh, synchronous 
detection method. Okay, so synchronous detection method meaning I need to, uh, I need to uh, multiply with the local carrier, and this one let's say is a C three T. All right, C three T. So that means uh, this is my C three. So this is my C3 omega. All right. So now I multiply. <clears throat> okay, let's look at the magic after we multiply in time domain. So what's going to happen at point D? All right, at point D. So now we multiply, we, we multiply or we convolve this entire spectrum. Now you treat this whole thing, huh? From negative 35k to positive 35k, the entire spectrum here, all right, as one whole group. And then this whole entire spectrum center at zero, right? So we're going to shift this entire thing to center at 20k, all right? This entire thing to center at 20k. So entire thing center at 20k, zero center and 20k, you got nothing. All right. But minus 20k, minus 20k, basically uh, we are going to minus 20 plus 20 is going to center at zero. Right or not? Yeah. This is uh, FC minus, minus FMT or FC plus FMT. So minus 20k here. All right, because zero is going to shift to 20K. So minus 20K is going to be shifted to center at zero, right? So we're going to have is So if you know how to do the sh frequency shifting in, in frequency domain, then it's actually very easy to work out the spectrum. If you want to do it in time domain, uh, you'll find that it's very, very, very hard because your your equation is going to get more and more complex. So that's why uh, for uh, AM modulations, we actually do uh, the, um, the analysis in frequency domain. So let me draw again this one. I need to, I need to go to 40K, so I need to expand a little bit. Okay, so now omega. Okay, at point D, <coughs> so I'm going to have something that center. So this 20k now will center at zero. All right, so let's get color. So let me draw here. So this is 5k, 5k. So I'm going to have this. Yeah, and then I'm going to have uh, okay, this whole thing shift to center. Okay, um, then what about this one? This one add with this one. Is going to center at 40k. All right, so let me write down my frequency first. This is 5k, this is 10k, this is 15k. All right, so I got my 20k here. So 20k, 40k will be about here. This is 40k. So this whole thing will be shifted to 40k. Right, I'm going to in Chai draw on here because I'm not interested in the 40k one later actually because later I'll filter it. Okay, you have some at one at 40k, <coughs> and then that is this whole spectrum convolved with this 20k. All right, I shift this whole spectrum to center around this 20k here. Sorry, 20k, and now what about this one? <coughs> This one, I'm going to shift the whole spectrum down to center at minus 20k. So again, 0, minus 20k, I got nothing at 20, minus 20k. 
isn't it? I got nothing in minus 20 k. But this plus 20 k will be shifted to center at zero as well. Yeah, center at zero as well. So you see that my uh, as far as amplitude is concerned, right? I'm going to have double amplitude here. All right, and then uh, same thing for this one is with double. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, do a simple sketch to do. Again, this is just sketch, huh? so I'm not going to draw uh, the exact one. So we're going to have something like this. All right, same thing, this one also would double. All right, would double as well, but again, leave it like this. Huh? Um, then the minus, minus 20 one will go to minus 40. All right, so we're going to have something at minus 40k. So same thing here, you're going to have uh, something like this. And you're going to have uh, something like this. All right, center at minus 40k. Um, I'm only interested in recovering the signal that is at baseband. All right, so what I do is I have to pass this signal through a low pass filter, isn't it? I have to pass this signal through a low pass filter if I want to recover M1. Remember, uh, red color is my M1. Okay, red color is my M1 now. So this is my M1. So to recover M1, I'm going to pass this signal through a low pass filter. Okay, so what low pass filter shall I use? At point D, after at point D, let's go back to my point D. Point D is this one here. All right, so recover M1, I need to So here, I need to pass the signal through a low pass filter one, and that will recover my M1T. All right, that will recover my M1T. So what should be my low pass filter be? Because I need to specify the pass band, isn't it? So in this case, how do I re how do I uh what kind of filter do I use here? Uh, Alamak. Erase the wrong thing block. Okay. What kind of filter? Low pass filter, isn't it? So what is the pass band of this low pass filter? 5k, isn't it? Because I want to recover my signal here, which is 5k. My base band is 5k. Alright. So in this case, I use a low pass filter one. Okay. With cutoff frequency. 5k. All right, so that means my pass band is 0 to 5 kilohertz. Okay, this will be to recover M1. Uh, M1 omega, uh, I mean frequency domain, so I talk about omega. Okay, so this is what happened at point D and uh, I need to do low pass filtering in order to recover my M1. So how to recover my M2? My M2 is this one here, it's centered at 10K. That means I need to shift it down to baseband. All right, I need to recover my M2 by shifting it back to baseband. So how to shift it back to baseband? Multiply also, isn't it? Multiply with a carrier frequency of 10k. Alright, same thing because we for M2, we actually multiply with a carrier frequency of 10k here. So now at the receiver, we need to do the same thing. Alright, except that it's in the reverse manner. So I need to multiply, oops, I need to multiply with 2 cosine um, 10,000t. Okay. So let me call this, uh, I call it C3. Uh, and I call it C4, man. C4T must be same as C1T. Uh. All right, where C3T must be same as C2T. All right, so I multiply. So I have point D, now let's go to point E. Okay, after my multiply, what do I get? 
Okay, so here now is uh, multiply with 10k. Let's draw it. So again, in frequency domain, multiplication mean I need to do frequency shifting, right? So let me draw the spectrum of uh, C4 Omega. It's 10k, isn't it? This is 10k, this is minus 10k. All right, so that will give me Okay, now this thing, <coughs> I'm going to shift it down by 10K. Of course, you can consider the entire group of uh, spectrum as well. But uh, now we are only interested in baseband. So we can omit these two. All right, let's look at this one alone. Yeah, uh, this one alone. So now I shift uh, everything to center, everything here to center at 10K. All right, so that means uh, I'm going to have uh, let me jot down my 10k. Okay, this is my 10k. Um, this is my minus 10k. 5 is here, 5 is here, 0 is here. Alright, so now I move everything center at 10k. So this is uh, 0, this is minus 5k. Alright, so that means I'm going to have center at 10k, which is this one now. Right, so here also same thing, center at 10k. All right, then the five, what, what do I center here? Okay, this whole thing now, minus 10k will be center to zero. Okay, here, and also uh, this one, this one, also will be, you shift this whole thing to center around here. So this one will be center at this point, right? Now, if I shift the entire thing to negative 10K, so I have this one, isn't it? So this one will be shifted to center at zero as well. Plus 10K, minus 10K, and up zero, all right? So what I'm gonna have basically is a higher amplitude of uh, this one here. Right, so this will be my, this will be my M2. All right, so now I have brought M2 to baseband. The next thing I need to do again is just to use a filter. All right, so again, I need to filter. Again, it will be a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency at five, 5k as well. Okay, not hertz, uh, sorry, uh, I mean omega, right? No, I remember. Uh, okay, the previous one, this is not, not 5k, huh? not 5 kilohertz. Huh? 5, 5 what? Uh, we cut off frequency equals to 5k radian per second. All right, so this is also k radian per second because we're in omega. Okay, so this will be um, correction up here uh, for those who are copying. This is 5k radian per second. So same thing, uh, this one we need to, we can recover with with a low pass filter. It's the same low pass filter actually. Low pass filter number two uh, with cut off frequency. equals to 5k radian per second. All right, therefore the pass band is 0 to 5k radian per second. All right, so let's draw in the diagram here. So we are going to recover with the low pass filter number two, and that will give us 
M2T. Okay. O plus filter, this is F. O plus filter, okay. So you can see, uh, um, the reason I actually draw this thing here is for you to see, okay? So in modulation, right, we multiply this signal, all right, we add the spectrum, uh, we add the signal and then we multiply again. So at the receiver, we basically need to multiply with whatever they will multiply last in the transmitter, all right, followed by uh, we multiply first here. So it's just a reverse process. Huh? And followed by low pass filtering. Yeah. So uh, all, all recovery circuit will have a low pass filtering that actually pass the um, baseband signal that you need. Uh, the, the high frequency one, uh, we, we can reject them. Okay, so that is for this part. And then um, okay, you need to take down D and E, right? You want to take this down first, this block diagram. Tell me when you're done, then I scroll down to show you the spectrum down there. Of course, the question just say, uh, suggest a method to recover each individual signal. All right. So it's very easy. You just suggest like this. But uh, how to prove that your the method that you suggest actually works. So you need to actually work out the spectrum, uh, which is uh, at the bottom. Have you take, done already? Not yet. Let me know when you're done. Done. Okay, so that would be uh, this part here. So wait, uh, I think I forgot. This is at point, at point E, isn't it? Okay. All right, we have 10 minutes left. So um, let me see what we can do. Are you finished? Let me know when you're done also. All right, so please, please make yes. sure. You, yeah. Uh, okay. I'm not yet done, wait. Oh, okay. Make sure you go and draw this yourself. Huh? Okay, done. Okay. So, uh, any any questions? Anybody want uh, further explanation or not? Or uh, is it clear? You understood already? Uh, Miss, I want to ask. Uh, ah. If the carrier frequency amplitude is higher, ah. then the, uh, if, if it, is it, will it affect the original amplitude Original signal amplitude. For double sideband suppressed carrier? Yeah, for this. Uh, okay, it's, it's not a problem actually because uh, if, it, if it's higher, it will also be in, uh, what do you call that? In uh, proportion. So if you recall the, let me, let me get back the, this one here. If you are using double sideband suppressed carrier modulation, double sideband suppressed carrier modulation. Okay, you can see that the, the, the this is a transmitted version, right? So uh, the amplitude of the sideband will be VNVC over two. 
So you are using, let's say you are using, this is for transmitted. Then for receiver, right, we're interested in receiver, isn't it? For receiver, if you are multiplying, you are multiplying, then, uh, where do I get? Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, this one here, demodulation. All right, demodulation here. So the baseband is this one that you are interested in, right? So if your VC is higher than your VM, no problem because this is just a constant. So everything will be increased uh, proportionally. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So just use the formula to calculate the MBTO. Uh. Yeah, correct. Uh, okay. All right, anything else? Yeah, always use the formula. Always refer back to the formula. That's a good point. Because uh, a lot of times I ask students to calculate the power, don't know how to calculate. If you just use back the formula, it's very easy. Okay, uh, any other questions? If not, then I think we better stop here. Lah. Not much time for me to discuss other questions really. Uh, so you... Record uh only the only only the what do you call that the lecture is recorded the tutorial I did not record. Okay. Um, any other questions before we end the class? If not, then uh, wait now. Let me. Let me get your attendance. I think you got your attendance already. Okay. So let's stop here then. Uh, meet you again uh, in your tutorial. Oh, oh, okay. Another thing about next Monday class. Next Monday lecture, I think I conduct as usual. Lah. Lazy to replace. Not easy to find time to replace also. Okay. Next week's class, uh, as usual. Huh? <laughs> Since you can't uh, go for uh, anywhere uh, May somebody yeah. Wednesday go class on this huh? Wednesday? Go class on this Wednesday, yeah. This Wednesday go class, ah. Go class, okay. Go, go, go. Uh, only Thursday, Thursday class I replaced already. So, uh, Thursday, Friday, uh, Friday, you don't have class with me, so no problem. Okay, yeah. Uh? All right, then. Goodbye, then. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Miss. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.